Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. There's one other unbelievably tragic thing that happened this week, and Dwayne Wade left and is going to Chicago. And uh, for those of you who were mourning about that, we'll have a special time of prayer in the conference room at the, uh, at the end of the service. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. For the last six months, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount. We're actually getting close to the end of our study. Our, our theme has been titled, Flipped. And, and the idea being that God desires to take the way that you and I look at things, the way you and I see things, and turn them upside down. In other words, the gospel, the message of the gospel flips us. It completely changes us so that those of us who are in Christ Jesus are new creatures Old things have passed away, and in Jesus Christ, all things have become new. I trust that this message series is flipping your life. I trust that it's turning your life upside down. You are beginning to think, and you're beginning to act like a true follower of Jesus Christ. In today's passage, Jesus deals with another incorrect way of thinking, an incorrect way of acting. Let me say up front, all of us are guilty of what Jesus talks about in this passage. Sometimes, maybe like me, you have a tendency to read a passage, hear a message, and kind of be thinking, boy, I hope that person over there is getting it. I hope they're listening to what Brian is saying. Let me say this. I need today's message. You need today's message. Because to one degree or another, all of us are guilty of what Jesus is talking about in this passage. All of us to one degree or another are critical. All of us to one degree or another are judgmental and even pharisaical in our thoughts and in our actions. So notice we're in Matthew chapter 7, going to read the first Six verses. Follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. I'm reading out of the ESV. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give the dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot, and they turn and attack you. Lord, help us to understand these verses. They're direct. They're straightforward. They cut to the chase. They speak to each and every one of us. Give us ears to hear today. Give us hearts to respond. Make us willing to respond and react to your word. And we thank you for what you're going to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, these verses are simple and straightforward. You don't need a theology degree to understand what Jesus is teaching us in these verses. They basically give us three commands, three simple commands that I kind of want us to flesh out, put in our mind, our heart, and our pocket so that we can begin to live them out on a regular basis. The first command is don't judge. The second command is examine yourself. And the third command is use wise discernment. Those are our three points. If you have the outline in front of you, don't judge, examine yourself, and use wise discernment. So notice with me the first command. 
Don't judge. It's found in verse 1, and Jesus says it once again so simply that, that a child can understand. Don't judge or judge not so that you will not be judged. The NIV says it this way, do not judge or you too will be judged. The Message Bible says it in a more simple way. Don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures. Don't criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the exact same treatments. Jesus gives two reasons in the passage why we should not judge others. Let me mention them quickly. The first is this. You and I should not judge others because one day you will be judged by God. Brian shouldn't judge others because one day Brian will be judged by God. Think with me today, folks. There is only one person who is eligible. There is only one person who is qualified. There is only one person who is certified. There is only one person who is authorized to judge, and that is God himself. Neither you nor I have been entrusted with the responsibility to judge others. And yet sometimes we act, and I'm not talking to you. Listen, God has beaten me up this week over this, all right? Sometimes we act as if God has commissioned us with the responsibility of judging others. And it's important that none of us have been given that responsibility. We've been given many responsibilities by God, but we've never been given the responsibility to judge others. The reason for that is because you and I one day, we ourselves will be judged by God. Notice several verses, Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I know I'm speaking to a smart crowd today. What does the word all mean? All. Every one of us, every single one of us here today will one day stand before God. None of us are exempt. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter whether you're listed as the pastor of the church. All of us will stand before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. John MacArthur in his commentary states that whenever we judge others, it demonstrates that we have an erroneous view of God. It doesn't demonstrate that we have an erroneous view of others. It doesn't even demonstrate we have an erroneous view of ourselves necessarily, but it demonstrates whenever I judge, whenever I criticize others, it demonstrates that I have an erroneous view of God. Why is that? Because I place myself on God's level. And it's not that I raise myself up, it's that in my mind, I bring my God down to my level. And I place myself on God's level as if I was equal to God. There's a second reason in the passage why we should not judge. The second reason is this, because by judging others, you open yourself to the judgment of others. You see, by judging others, I expose myself. I open myself up so that others may judge me. Notice verse 2. Notice what Jesus says. With the judgment you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you measure others, you will be measured. It's really interesting to look at the verse because the word judge is found three times. The way that you judge others, you will be judged by that. The way that you measure others, you will be measured in the exact same way. That's what Jesus is stating. People will judge you with the same standard that you use to judge others. Let me show you uh, how Luke Um, characterizes this exact same teaching of the Lord. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. That, That one shouldn't be there. Luke 6, 37 and 38. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Same command. But, But Luke continues. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, 
shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the same measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. We have a tendency to use that verse talking about giving. If you give, God will give back to you. To the same way that you give, you will receive from God. But notice in the context, he's not just talking about giving. He's talking about judging. He's talking about condemning. He's talking about forgiving. And he says the same way that you treat others, it what? It will be given back to you. Here's what the passage is saying. He's saying that that type of judging is like a boomerang. A boomerang. If you judge other people, it's like a boomerang, and such judgment will come back to you. Boomerang is a great sporting device. I'm not sure whether you've used it before. It actually began as a weapon by the Aborigines in Australia, and they would use it to hunt animals. I know very few people that use a boomerang to hunt today. For us, it's become a little bit of a sporting device, and the idea is what? If you throw it, it'll come back to you. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. You thought I was going to do it for a second, didn't you? <laughs> so I actually contemplated trying to do that, and then I thought, well, uh, we'd probably have to have uh, medical personnel here, either for me or for, for someone else. Here's the idea. Whenever you are critical of someone else, look out, it very possibly is going to come back to you. Whenever you're judgmental of someone else, look out, it's going to come back to you. But whenever you're kind and forgiving to someone else, that attitude also will boomerang, as it were, back to you. The Message Bible translates Matthew 7, 2 in this way. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging, is what the Message Bible says. If you're judgmental to others, they will be judgmental to you. If you condemn others, they will condemn you. On the other hand, though, if you forgive others, if you're patient with others, if you're gracious with others, if you're merciful with others, such an attitude will be given back to you because Jesus said, remember, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, so here's, the, here's the very first thing that Jesus says. Don't judge others. Can you say that with me today? Don't judge others others. First command, found in the imperative form, in the, conf- in the command form in the text. But there's a second command. It gets a little bit more personal. Second command is this, examine yourself. In other words, take your eyes off of other people and put your eyes on yourself. Notice verse 3, what Jesus says, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye but you do not notice the log that is in your eye. Now let me pause. I love the humor of the Bible. Sometimes we fail because our culture, there's cultural, it's been translated, and we fail to see the humor of the Bible. I am confident that when Jesus used this illustration that there were some chuckles in the crowd because they got what Jesus was saying. So so here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, okay, here is Brian. I have this log sticking out of my eye. That this great big log, I'm going to scratch my glasses. This, uh, this great big log that's sticking out of my eye. Now, listen, is this log obvious? If I walked up to it this morning and I started saying, welcome to Hollywood Community Church, we're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time here, we'd like to welcome you back. You would sit back and think, what is the deal with that guy? He's got a log sticking out of his eye. It's obvious I should notice, right? So I should be concerned about this log that's sticking out of my eye. But all of a sudden, I get this log sticking out of my eye, and I look down and I say, oh, my word, Mike, you have a little speck of dirt in your eye right there. Let me pull that little speck of dirt out of your eye. And you'd sit back and say, Brian, what is the deal with you? I mean, you should be focused on that log that's protruding out of your eye and you are paying attention to something insignificant, small, that's in the eye of Mike. That's ridiculous. It's ludicrous, is it not? And yet, that's exactly what you and I do on a regular basis. That's exactly what Brian does 
on a regular basis. Jesus said in verse 4, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log sticking out of your own eye? Here's what I wrote down. It's in your notes. It is so easy to see the faults of others, yet so difficult to see our own faults. Can I get a witness on that? Anybody agree? It is so easy to see the faults of others. And it's so difficult to see our own faults. Listen, if you put a gun to my head, I could talk with, I could talk with eloquence about the faults of certain people in our congregation. All right, I'm not going to do that. You say, Brian, why is that? Because to me, their faults are so obvious. And yet you probably could talk about all the faults of Brian if you were forced to do so, all right? Please don't do that, all right? But, it, but if you do, please talk to Vic and, and let her filter out whether they're true or whether, whether, they're, whether they're not true. Listen, we have a tendency to see the faults of others, yet it's so difficult to see our own faults. We see the sins of others. We criticize, we judge, and we condemn others when we have problems just as big in our own life. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you practice the exact same things. Why is it that we maximize the sins of others, but we minimize our sins? Man, to us, the sins of other people are grievous. To us, the sins of other people are horrendous. And we can even talk about different groups in our society, and we can talk about how abhorrent their sins are. And we fail to realize that there is unconfessed sin in our life. There are, there are pockets of our hearts that are dirty, that if they were exposed to the light we would be embarrassed. We maximize the sins of others and we tend to minimize our own sins. Here's what Jesus calls that, hypocritical. Here's what Jesus says, it is hypocritical to criticize the weaknesses of others without dealing with your own weaknesses. Verse 5, he says, you hypocrite, strong words, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Hey, listen, this week, I've had to sit down before God and say, okay, God, what are the logs in my eye? God, what are the things that, for some reason, to me, are not obvious, yet to you, they are so very obvious. God, help me to take those logs out of my eye. Can I ask you today, would you just take a second and do a little bit of self-examination? What are the logs in your eye? What, what are the sins in your life? They might be sins that are obvious to other people. They very honestly might be sins that are so secret that no one else knows. Maybe God is the only one who knows what's going on in that thought life. Maybe God is the only one who knows the, the deceitfulness and the sinfulness of your heart. But it's a log in your life. And it is hypocritical to not deal with that log and at the same time, be critical of the, the motes, the specks, the small pieces of sin that are found in the lives of others. You see, in the passage that we're studying, the log represents something. We have to be true to the context. The log in our passage refers to self-righteousness. 
As Jesus is dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees, he's attacking their self-righteousness. You'll remember throughout the entire sermon, Jesus has been all over the scribes and the Pharisees for their self-righteousness. They simply thought that they were spiritually better than everyone else. I mean, I mean, they would look at this poor sinner and say, oh God, I'm so grateful that I'm not like him. I'm so grateful that I'm not like her. And they had this spiritual sense of superiority. Yet as we walk through the passage, we see that they were in no way more spiritual. They got angry. They lusted. They divorced their wives They failed to fulfill their oaths, their promises. They hated their enemies. Yet somehow in their own minds, they justified their actions. And they looked at others as if they were less spiritual than themselves. Let's pause for a second and say we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to do the exact same thing. Especially those of us who are believers and have been believers for a significant period of time, it's easy for us to forget from where we have come. It is easy from us to, for us to forget the rock from which we have been hewn, as the Bible talks about. It's easy for us to forget what we were like before Jesus came into our lives. And it's easy for us to act as if we are these Super Christians that would never commit the sins that other people are committing. Let me remind you of a few truths today. And this is so very important. Grab a hold of this today. Okay, the first is this. This is in your notes. You are bankrupt of any spiritual righteousness. Let me say that again. Let me personalize it. I am bankrupt of any personal spiritual righteousness. Two words or two verses, Isaiah 64 and verse 6. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds like a polluted garment. Pause for just a second and think about the best thing you did this week. I mean, seriously, think about the best thing you did. I mean, maybe, maybe your wife was just coming at you guys and you sat there and you demonstrated godly patience with your wife. You bit your tongue and you responded, you think, like God would have responded. And you walked away patting yourself on the back thinking, heaven is giving me a standing ovation right now because of the way I responded to my wife. Or maybe, maybe you magnanimously gave, you found somebody who had a need and, and you, you sacrificially gave to help that person. Maybe it was money that you needed, but, but you were so burdened for this person, you gave money to help that person. And, and once again, man, that was a fantastic thing you did. Or, or maybe you've been praying about sharing the gospel with a coworker, and in the light of everything that happened, God opened the door and, and you shared Jesus with this coworker. Think about the very best thing that you did this week. Here's what God says. In his eyes, that, that act that seems so good, so magnanimous, so holy to you, in God's eyes, is just like filthy rags. All of our righteous deeds, the best things that we do in God's eyes, can never meet the standard. The, the, the Hebrew word that is used for, for polluted garment there is a word that's so graphic that I won't even tell you exactly what it means. But you'll have to take my word that it means something un believably dirty. Here's the idea. I can never be good enough. In and of myself, I can never be good enough. I can never do enough spiritual acts. I can never have enough patience. I can never overcome enough sins. I can never help enough people. I cannot be good enough on my own. 
Paul says it this way in Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Listen, we need to understand that in ourselves, we are bankrupt of any spiritual righteousness. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, you're painting an awful bleak picture. Let me give you the good news. Here's the good news. The only righteousness that you have is that of Jesus Christ that was gifted to you by God the Father. The only righteousness that I have The only righteousness that you have is the righteousness of Jesus that was gifted. It was freely gifted to me, and it was freely gifted to you. Notice what Paul says, Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 for our sake. He made him to be sin. He made, God made Jesus to be sin for us, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. We've explained this before, but let me just pause. It's so important. So the moment that you give your life to Jesus Christ, two things happen. There's a lot of spiritual words. You're justified. You're declared righteous, all of that stuff. But but there's this transaction that takes place. All of your sins, all of your sins that you've committed, are committing, and we're committing, all of your sins are placed in the account of Jesus Christ. And he takes all of your sin and pays the price for all of your sins so that there is no condemnation to you who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that? He paid for everything. Paid in full. All of your sins have been paid for. Past, present, and future. But that's not the only thing that happens. Not only does he pay for all of your sins, but the righteousness The perfect life of Jesus Christ. He was tempted in every way like you and I are, yet without sin. That righteous life, all of his righteousness is placed into our accounts. And I can say today that I have righteousness. God views me as righteous, but it's not a righteousness of my own. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been given to me. So catch that. Any good thing I do is not because I'm a good person. Any sin that I overcome is not because I'm a super Christian and I have more spiritual stamina than you do. Anything that I accomplish for God is not because I have more power than you have. Anything I do, anything I accomplish, any victory I have is not because of me. It's because of Jesus and Jesus alone. As a result of that, I have no reason to brag I have no reason to brag. I have no reason to boast. I have no reason to judge others. Because at the very best, I am a sinner that has been saved by the grace of God. And guess what? You are too. You are too when we truly understand who we are, when we truly understand what God has done for us, there is no reason to judge. There is no reason to be critical because we realize that were it not for the grace of God, that's me. Were it not for the grace of God, I could be, might be, probably would be doing the exact same thing. Everything I am, everything I have comes from God. He alone gives me the strength. He alone gives me the ability to be victorious. How can I judge others? Because I realize who I am. Listen, I shared with our Spanish congregation just a few moments ago, I've been saved for 47 years. 
going on 48 years. I know I look so young. Somebody looked at me yesterday and said, Pastor Brian, you look so young. I said, keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming. I've been saved for almost 47 years. I've been in ministry for 30 years. For more than 30 years, I've pastored and I preached. Can I tell you, I am still a work under construction. God is still working on me. He is. I'm so glad that you don't know me like I really am. On Sundays, I comb my hair, I take a shower, I put on some decent clothes, and I try my very best to look like a pastor. But listen, I'm like you. I have struggles in my life. There, there's some things that God is dealing with me about, some dark areas that I still have a lot of work on. I say that for this reason. I realize, who am I to judge anyone? And listen, in a loving way, you're still a work in progress as well. If we could ever sit back and take our eyes off the faults of others and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, God, I'm trusting you to work in that person's life, but you know what, man? I got enough to work on in my life. I don't have time to be worrying about someone else. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't judge others. Examine yourself. Be honest with yourself and allow God to work in your life. There's a third thing, and I gotta be done. The third thing is this, use wise discernment. Notice verse six, what Jesus says. He says, don't give the dogs what is holy, and don't throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. All right, so I'm gonna tell you exactly what I wrote in my notes after I read that verse, okay? I read that verse and I wrote, what? I mean, do you read that? I mean, you sit there and read that and you think, what in the world does that mean? He's been telling us not to judge each other. We're getting all of that. And then all of a sudden he says, don't give that which is holy to dogs and don't throw your pearls before pigs or they're going to attack you. <laughs> All right, okay, Vicky, put the pearls away, all right? Let's not throw our meat to dogs, all right? Got it, all right? What in the world is he talking about? Well, Jesus closes this illustration with a thunderbolt that seems to contradict what he had just said. When we really understand this last verse, it blows away the concept that in the name of love and humility, we are never to oppose wrong. We are never to correct wrongdoers. And at times people say that. Listen, you have no right to say anything about what I'm doing, the way I'm living. You have no right to say anything. Jesus kind of contradicts that in the passage. Dogs, so we understand, dogs were not the domesticated animals in the New Testament that they are today. Dogs in New Testament times were half-wild mongrels and scoundrels. You, you would never throw a piece of meat. You went to the temple and you laid this piece of meat in the temple and you dedicated, you consecrated this piece of meat to God. You would never leave the temple and take that holy piece of meat and just throw it to a dog. You would never do that. You would desecrate the holiness of that. In the same way, you would never take pearls, which in New Testament times are one of the most precious jewels. You would never take pearls and you would cast them to what the Jewish people believe, the filthiest animal. You would cast it before swine. You would cast it before pigs. Why would you take that which is holy, that which is beautiful, that which is valuable, and give it to a creature that does not appreciate it, that does not value it. So what is Jesus saying? Let me give you two things in your notes and then we'll apply it and we'll be done. The command to not judge does not prohibit us from compassionately protecting that which is holy. Let me say it again. The command to not judge does not prohibit us from compassionately protecting that which is holy. You say, what does that mean? Let me say it even more practical. We are to carry the gospel to every single creature. 
But we must not also cheapen the gospel by unwise discernments. Here's what Jesus is saying. Although we are not to judge others, although we are first and foremost and most importantly to judge and examine ourselves, we are to use wise discernment in sharing the gospel, in sharing the holy things of God with those who are incapable of understanding it and those who are incapable of appreciating it. Let me give you three examples. The first is this, the Lord's Supper. We take the Lord's Supper the last Sunday of every month. The Lord's Supper is limited to those who have confessed their sins. The Lord's Supper is limited to those who understand the truth of the gospel and have become followers of Jesus Christ. We don't take that which is holy, symbolized in the bread and the wine, and give it to someone who does not believe in Jesus Christ. We do not take that which is holy and offer it to someone who does not value it or does not appreciate it. Church membership. Church membership is limited to those who have confessed their sins, to those who have followed the Lord in believer's baptism, to those who have made a commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Church membership, being an official part of the body, is valuable. We just don't throw it to someone who doesn't value, understand, or appreciate the truth of the gospel. Church leadership. Church leadership, in the words of Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, church leadership is limited to those who are blameless. The word doesn't mean perfect there, but it means those who are striving to live in such a way that there is nothing that you can grab onto in their life. You see, we don't take that which is so sacred and value and cheapen it and devalue it by not demanding, by not preaching the demands of the gospel. So I say all that to say this. Here I'm done. Here at HCC, everyone is welcome. Uh, Catch that. Everyone is welcome at Hollywood Community Church no matter your past sins, no matter your present sins, no matter the struggles that you are going through, everyone is welcome here. We promise to love you. We promise to care for you. We promise to point you to Jesus. We promise to treat you as one of our family. But we realize God has more for you. God desires that you grow in your walk. God desires that you turn from your sins. God desires that you embrace his way of living, that you recognize his holiness, and to the best of your ability, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, you strive for the holiness of God. We promise to not judge you. But we promise we are going to push you. We are going to pull you. We are going to yank you. We're going to do everything we can towards righteousness so that you will be the believer that lives in such a way that honors and glorifies God. So today as we conclude, let me give you just a couple of questions for you to answer. The first question is this. Do you view others with a self-righteous attitude? This is a great week to ask these questions. As we view everything that's happening around our country, do you view others with a self-righteous attitude? The second question is this, have you received the gift of Jesus' righteousness? Have you realized that you cannot make it on your own? You cannot go to church enough. You can't be good enough. You can't give enough. You cannot do enough. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you have asked by faith for that righteousness and you've received it. And thirdly, are you striving to live a life of holiness that truly pleases God? Say, Brian, what does that mean? Not that you're perfect because none of us are, but when the Holy Spirit points out something in your life, you're willing to address it. Here's what James says. He who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. 
God desires for us to be holy. And God desires for us to be vessels that he can use for his honor and for his glory.